Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to CT Church. If you weren't already greeted by Miss Tina earlier, praise the Lord. Love you. Thank you so much. Um, we are going to do something special today. It's uh, we're getting ready to go back to school, and so we're going to ask for all the children. The children can make their way up here to the front. Of all the children, please make their way to the front. And we're getting ready to send them back to school. Psalm 127 reads that children are an inheritance from the Lord. These children here are an inheritance. They are a blessing from the Lord. They've been given to us by the Lord. And so we should care for them and tend to them and, and treat them as the special gifts that they are. And so what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to pray for all the children. Man, we've got some kids in this church. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Okay, now I, I see we got some of the youth, which is good, but if you are attending college or trade school, we want you to come on up as well. Uh, university, college students, junior college, please, please come. Let's bring it in tight. Everybody, let's come in, come in here tight. Let's fill in these gaps. Let's fill in these gaps. And I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you all to face this way, okay? I want you to face this way because here's what else I want to do. All right. It is a special, special, special calling to teach children, to be an educator. And so if there's anybody here who is an educator, who has any role in education, you may be the maintenance person at a school. You help keep that environment clean and safe so these people can educate. So I want all of our teachers, like Miss Jamie's first year teacher this year, right? Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And Miss Amber, all right? And Miss Samantha is in education, and Miss Sylvina and others. If you are an educator, and also now, um, okay, okay, yeah, thank you, Elijah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. All right. Okay, sign them up for the pulpit. <laughs> homeschool parents, you educate as well, so please make your way up here. Homeschool parents, amen. Praise the Lord. And I'm going to ask you as we're going to go ahead and, and pray for all these beautiful blessings that the Lord has given us. Right, I'm going to ask that you would extend your right hand in agreement that we would pray the Lord's blessing upon them. All right. Father, we love you. We praise you, God. We give thanks for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for Father, for blessing us with these numerous blessings, my Lord, the beautiful children that you have left for us, my Lord, as an inheritance. And my God, we just ask, Lord, that today, this day, my Lord, that they receive your anointing, that, Father, that you would wash over them and flood them, my God, with your anointing. For your anointing will break the yoke, the yoke of bondage of the world and, and the influences of the world that may try to come upon these children in these school environments. But, my God, we pray, my Lord, for discernment. We pray for your protection, both spiritually and physically, my Lord, that no harm would come to any of their schools, my Lord, that every school that these children step into, my Lord, walks in the, the child of God, which then brings your protection, your protection, my Lord, so all these schools will be protected and, and, and guarded from any harm, any ill will, my Lord, and that you would bless their classrooms, bless their teachers, my Lord, and though their teachers may not know you, may they get to know you through these blessings here, my Lord, that they would be a light and a beacon in these places of education, my Lord. And Father, for all the teachers here and the faculty and staff and support teams that support these schools, my Lord, we ask, Lord, that you bless them, that you would use them, my Lord, to further the kingdom, that they would sow good seed into the children that they are teaching, that they would be a godly influence, my Lord, that their light would shine so bright, my Lord, that the principals would be coming to them, asking them for advice, saying, I see that your class is prospering. I see that your students are doing well. What is your secret? And they'll say it is no secret, but it is the grace of God that's on our class, my Lord. And so let your grace be upon them, my Lord. Bless them with all their days. Be a joy, Father. Let, let them change. Let these world changers here begin to recognize their calling and change the world one class at a time, my Lord. So, Father, begin to move, my Father, in their lives. Protect them all. Blessings, my Lord. Joy, my Lord. Peace. Let them sleep well tonight before going to school tomorrow. Or that day. Let there not be any anxiety, my Lord, but let there be peace because they are walking in your will. Father, we love you. We praise you. 
in Jesus' name. And all the saints said, amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. God bless you. All right, and with that, it is tithe and offering time here at CT Church, amen? It's your chance to give, your chance to walk in obedience, to return the tithe unto the Lord. And so, my, so we'd ask that you begin to prepare your tithes and offering. As you do, there's several ways to give. You can write a check. You can place cash in there. There's envelopes in the seat backs in front of you. You can text CT Church at 833-257-8695. We'll send you a link. But also, on the seat backs in front of you, there's a connect card. There's a QR code. You can zap that QR code and also find uh, a link tree and select to give. And you can go there and to give. When you give online, make sure you select New Caney Tithes. You select the New Caney location, all right? And that way we can uh, make sure the funds are properly allocated to this campus. If you are new to us, we are one of six CT campuses. And there's five of them in the Houston area and one now in Moralton, Arkansas. Uh, so we like to make sure we can uh, make sure the, the funds get properly allocated. Amen. Uh, so you can go ahead and prepare your tithes and offering. Have, give a couple announcements for you. Uh, this coming uh, Saturday, uh, the young adults, the young, I'm sorry, no, the youth, the youth, not the young adults, the youth are having game night here at the church. All right, so it's a night of fun and games and pizza, of course. Can't have a youth night without pizza. And uh, so there'll be pizza here uh, 6 to 8.30 this, uh, this Saturday uh, here at the church. So if you are a middle schooler or a high schooler, uh, come and celebrate your first week of school uh, here with us. Amen. And then uh, we also have, I think, on, uh, yeah, Friday night as well. Friday night is the men's conference, which is uh, the 12th. And you need to register online. So you can go to our website. If you, if you just go to our website at uh, myctnewcaney.org, you can uh, just uh, scroll down to the bottom. There's a, a link there for you to register online. We encourage you to go ahead and do so online. Amen. All right, so with that, we're going to go ahead and pray for these tithes and offering, and then we'll go ahead and collect them. Father, we thank you, Lord, and praise you, my God, for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for this morning. Thank you for the time to bless your children. We ask, Lord, that you would continue to move in this place. Bless those that are able to give today. We ask, Lord, that the seed would be planted in good ground, that it would produce a, a wonderful crop for you, my Lord, that we may further the kingdom, that we may multiply, my Lord, and, and grow for the goodness of your glory. Father, we thank you for the faithfulness of those giving. For those who cannot give, we ask, Lord, that you bless them with the ability to give. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. And all the saints said, amen. If you can pass the buckets from your left uh, to your right, and um, the ushers will come by and pick that up. Thank you. Okay, also, uh, in addition to us uh, sending off the kids and blessing all of our teachers, we do have some available school supplies for all you teachers and support staff. So we have some free school supplies uh, that were left over from our, our backpack fundraising effort. So you teachers, I know oftentimes you have to pay out of your pocket for some additional supplies in your class. So see uh, Bertha or Carol in the cafe afterwards, and they've got some supplies for you as well. Also, I think we have some backpacks still as well. No more backpacks? Okay. Sorry. Scratch that. Uh, all right. Also, there is a, a, a special class starting this Thursday at uh, the Rodriguez home. Henry and Claudia. Is, are Henry and Claudia here today? I haven't seen them yet this morning. They, oh, are they sick? Hope the class isn't canceled. Okay. So, uh, so this, this Thursday, Pastor Susan, uh, Pastor Norton's wife, she, she's going to be starting a six-week class at the, home, at the Rodriguez home on Thursday nights. It's a six-week class on the prophetic. 
So if you want to learn more about prophecy and how the prophetic works, Pastor Susan will be teaching that class at the Rodriguez home on Thursdays. Amen? And it'll be a six-week class again starting this Thursday. Praise the Lord. Okay, and I think, did I cover everything? Okay, did I cover it? Okay, is that good? Okay, we're good. Yes, Miss Carol. Yes, thank you. Yes, yes, so there's no child care for that class on Thursday. Yeah, thank you very much for reminding me of that. Thank you. All right, praise the Lord. So we are going to be in the book of Revelation today. We are going to be talking about the seven churches of Revelation. Uh, so this is actually, I'm letting you know up front, this is going to be a two-part series. All right, a two-part series. I was uh, trying to do it all in one, but it was just too much material for me to fit all into one week. Uh, so this will be a, a two-part series. Um, a real, real, real brief history, I guess, or just kind of a, maybe an editorial on the book of Revelation. Uh, it's oftentimes considered maybe one of the probably most well-known books of the Bible. Uh, the, the people who have never even been to church or even read the Bible have, have possibly heard of the book of Revelation. It's oftentimes, and not being the, the best known book, but oftentimes the most feared book and probably the most misunderstood book because there are so many perceptions and, and preconceived ideas uh, about it. You know, there's, there's the ominous four horsemen that we often hear about, and uh, there's global plagues, and there's famine, and there's wars, and there's, there's a mass uh, death, and uh, there's giant meteorites or comets falling from the sky, and the water's being poisoned, and plant, uh, plant life being destroyed, and the sea life uh, being decimated, and the livestock being obliterated, you know, um, there's, a, there's a beast, there's a dragon, there's the devil, you know, the antichrist, there's this great abyss. There's all these things that are, that are fixed and attached to the book of Revelation. There's the seven seals and the seven trumpets of judgment and the seven bowls of wrath. And, and there, there's all these, these things that are attached to Revelation. And when people think of Revelation, apocalyptic movies are made based upon it or they take something that they think is biblical, and they turn it into a movie, and um, you know, books are written about it, and they usually create fear. It usually causes fear when people hear the book of Revelation. And but please notice that I say the book of Revelation, there is no S on the end. It's one book, all right? Oftentimes people say revelations. It's not multiple revelations. It's one revelation. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. In fact, verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1 reads, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And this is where I where I say, I, I see the book differently. I see the book as a celebration. I see the book as a, as a decree of victory. And, and so I, when I read Revelation, I'm not scared. I, I, I see victory. I see joy. In 2 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verse 7, right? God did not give us a spirit of fear, right? He did not give us a spirit of fear, but he gave us a mind of power and love and a sound mind, not fear. And so, so you should not, I want to encourage you today, do not be fearful when you read the, the book of Revelation. And, and 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, that, that there, is, uh, there is no uh, fear in love. Perfect love cast out fear. Well, who is perfect love? Jesus is perfect love. He is the only one who is perfect, right? For none are righteous but one, and that one is Jesus Christ. And so in Christ, there is no fear. You have no, you have no fear in Christ. And, 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 and why is that? Because Christ is complete. He, he, he is the end all be all. He's just all that we need. Jesus is, in fact, the, the number seven is, is, is uh, accounted for a lot in the book of Revelation. There's seven churches, there's, there's seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls of wrath. There are seven, seven days in, in, in our week, right? The Lord created the earth in six days and the seventh day he rested. It was complete. There, there's, there's completeness in seven. Even, even the process of forgiving, right? In Matthew 18, uh, verse 22, it it, we're asked, well, how many times should I forgive my brother? He says, 70 times seven. You know, so, so, there, so there, there's seven. They're oftentimes representing completeness. And, and that's what Jesus is. Jesus is, is complete. And, and so that's why when I, when I read the book of Revelation, I, 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 I get enthused and excited. And, and so, so let, let, me, let me share with you here, and we're going to read in chapter number uh, one, and we're going to read through uh, verse 16, kind of set the tone here for you if I haven't already, amen? Praise the Lord. So uh, the, the book of Revelation, chapter one, verse one. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants 
things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth to him who loved us and washed us from our sins and his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with clouds and every eye will see him. Even they who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who was to come, the Almighty. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was on the island as called Patmos, for the, world, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. What you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. He, his head and hair were, like, were, like, were, were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as a sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in the strength. The title of today's message is Lessons from the Seven Churches of Revelation. Let us pray. Father, we love you and thank you, God, for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to gather in your name. Father, for we are here to, to receive from you, my Lord, to for us to give in our, our obedience to you and our worship and our praise. And Father, and we would love to hear from you today. So we ask that you would open our ears and soften our hearts to receive, my Lord. Show us, my God, what it is that you were speaking to the churches and how it would apply to us. Father, we love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, and all the saints said, amen. As I said, the book speaks about really our Lord returning. It speaks about, like I said, the victory that is to come because of Christ's return and, and what he does for us. You know, and, and I said, as I was talking about, people oftentimes view the book in fear and worry and concern, and I, I, I see it as a, as a point of celebration. You know, we, we celebrate Christmas every year. Christmas is probably the most joyous time in the entire world. I mean, the, the whole world is largely impacted and affected by Christmas. Even non-believers, I mean, enjoy Christmas. Non-believers will go to a Christmas party. They will. Non-believers got no problem taking time off from work for Christmas. I mean, politicians who disdain and criticize Christianity gladly take the entire month of December off for their Christmas holiday, yet they turn around and totally oppose the things of God, right? And yet, and yet they do it on our dime, right? I mean, so, so Christmas has, has had this great impact on people. It really does, even though there might be some people who aren't necessarily honoring and glorifying God, but they're being affected by Christmas. They're getting to see the goodness of the Lord. And we rejoice over that because Jesus came, why? To, to redeem us, to deliver us from our sin, that we can be reconciled with him, that we can be united with him. And so what happens is we are given a new life, but we have a new life still in this old broken world. But in the book of Revelation, we get to see that there is a new earth and a new heaven coming out in Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 and 2. It speaks about that. He says, I saw a new heaven. I saw a new earth. People sometimes, they miss this in the book of Revelation, that there is a new place being created for us. 
It's going to be new. And, and if you go on down to verse number four of uh, Revelation 21, then it speaks about in this place, there is no sorrow, there's no pain, there's no suffering, right? There, there, is, there is nothing that, that will cause you any tears. That, that there, there's no worry there. There's no hardship. There's no sickness. And then this is, this is what we, this is the victory I was speaking about. This is what we have to look forward to. This is the rejoicing that we have because of, of what he does. And, and right here in verse number in verse number three, it we read, it reads, blessed is he who reads and who hears the words of this prophecy. There is a blessing just for reading this book. So, so don't, I, I, for those of you that, again, that, that have had uh, perceptions and fear, and I don't understand, understand this, Jesus is Lord, and he's coming back, and we win. Amen? That's what you really need to understand. All right, and, and he has promises in there about the book of life, the Lamb's book of life. He, he gives us these, if, if you read Revelation 21, just read Revelation, just go ahead, jump to the end, Re, chapter 21, 22, and read about heaven, read about the tree of life and, and the river that's there to nourish us and, and, and provide for everything we need. And just, just do this, just up to the end, spoiler alert, okay, we win. All right, it, it's, it's, a, it's a good thing, it's a good book. We, live happy, we, we actually live happily ever after. We get that. That's our promise. That's what's there for us. And, and so, again, so when I, when I see Revelation, please understand, I, 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 that's how I see it. Because these things that are happening, that will happen with the seven seals and the trumpets and the, the bowls of wrath, that's for the non-believer. That's why I got nothing to worry about. It ain't for me. I'm not affected by that. I'm covered by the blood. Of, my name is written in the book. Right? Amen. So I'm sorry, that's a long runway to get to this first church, all right? So this is why it's going to be two weeks, all right? We're halfway through the, the time. We haven't got to one of the churches yet. So, so let, let's get into the churches. And, I, and, and I, I want you to understand this because sometimes people will look at the Bible and they, they get caught up. Well, you got to read in this context. Well, this was written to the church of Ephesus and the church of, well, so that means it doesn't apply to me? When Paul's writing to Thessalonica or to Colossae, to these other churches, does it mean not know it? The Bible is all encompassing. When he writes to somebody else, that's applicable for us. We can apply those things in our lives, right? And so, so when, when we talk about these churches, that's what I want you to do. Don't just think of it as happening in the first century, right? When, when John was writing this, it's not just for them. It's, it's timeless. God's word is timeless, right? Hebrews 13, 7, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? And so... Or is it 13.8? Can somebody correct me on that? I think it's Hebrews 13.7. Right, anyway, but he, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so his word is the same yesterday. What was, what was being spoken of to Ephesus and, and Pergamos and, and, and Thyatira and all these other churches is also applicable to us today. In fact, I see these seven churches as a representation of not only the church today and its different forms, but I also see it as a representation of us because after all, we make up the church. So if I am one of these, if, I am, if I'm demonstrating some of these characteristics in this book, right, then what's going to happen is if, if I'm like that, then there's a good chance the church is going to be like that, right? And so we have to recognize that these things are also speaking to us, God bless you, speaking to us individually, right? And so don't just see it as a, because again, don't just see it as a message to the church as a whole, because we are the church. So we, we, we make up the church. So, so let's look at Ephesus real quick. And Ephesus starts in, in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 1. I'm not going to go verse by verse, but in summary, uh, the Lord um, applauds them. He, he congratulates them for their good works and their, their intolerance of evil, uh, their, their patience, and, and he commends them for their endurance and not growing weary. And, and this is something we need to hold on to. In Psalm chapter 1, verse 6, it reads that the Lord knows the way of the righteous. The Lord sees you. He knows what you're doing, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. So don't think that what you're doing isn't being seen by the Lord. It is, right? 2 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 9, it reads that the Lord is going to, his eyes are going to and fro. Right? He's going to and fro throughout the earth, right? To strengthen those who have, who have been faithful to him. This is what the Lord is looking, the Lord's looking to strengthen you. 
but he wants to see that you're faithful because he wants to make, he's not going to give you strength to do something to go do evil. So he's looking for those that are faithful to him. And that's what it reads in 2 Corinthians 16. That the Lord is looking for people that are faithful because he wants to strengthen you. He wants to equip you. He wants to bless you. And, and, these, and these are the things that, that I see here with Ephesus, that, they were, that the Lord saw their faithfulness. He saw their good works. However, he says to them in chapter 2, verse 4, but you have forsaken your first love, he says. So he compliments them. You're doing good here, but... You know, you have the boss come in, hey, you're doing a really good job, but, and this is what happens with Ephesus. There's a but. You have forsaken your first love. And, and how does that happen? How does that, because we, we lose sight of, of what God's been doing, what he's done. We've, we've kind of grown cold and comfortable. You know, this is why I appreciate Psalm 51 so much. In verse three, it reads, um, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. And, and, I, and I, that's a verse that I've really held, over, held on to over the years because when I, when I see my sin, when I'm aware of my sin, I'm aware and reminded of his goodness. I'm reminded he's forgiven me of that, that I am not that any longer. You need to, you need to learn to change your vocabulary. You need to learn to, cha- <clears throat> excuse me, to, to, to change your expressions you are not a sinner saved by grace. You are a child of God now. When you accept Jesus Christ, you are a child of God. You're no longer a sinner. You may, have, you may stumble into sin after becoming a child of God, and you may fall into sin, but you are, a sinner is not who you are. You are a child of God now. You are saved by his grace. You are a saint. Right? And so stop saying, well, I'm a sinner saved by grace. No, you're not. You are a child of God. And and. When I, when I remember my sins, I remember what he's done for me. When, remembering your transgressions will remind you of his redemption. If you remember what you've done, you'll remember what he's done. Also, if you remember what you've done, you're not going to do it again because you're like, oh, wait a minute, the last time I went to that site, this thing popped up. I'm not going to that site. Last time I went to, it's awfully quiet in this Presbyterian church. Last time I went to that sports bar, this friendly waitress was there. You see? And so you say, I'm not going there now. You know what I'm saying? Because you got, if you don't remember what happened, then you're, you're de- more likely to repeat it. I read that those who do not learn from history are destined to repeat it. Right? And so this is why it's important that we remember what the Lord has done. So, and when David writes in Psalm 51, my transgressions are ever before me. It's to serve as a reminder, not as baggage to bog you down, but actually protection to keep you from going down the wrong road. Amen? Amen. All right. It's like, again, or changing it a little bit, when Jesus says, um, you have forsaken me, you're forsaken your first love. I, I thought of, now I'm going to date myself. Now some of you, you know, are with me, but... Uh, you may remember the Neil Diamond and Barbara Streisand song, You Don't Bring Me Flowers Anymore. Anybody remember that? You don't bring me flowers. Anybody remember that? Late 70s, all right. Was it late 70s, right? I think so. Anyways, it, you, interesting story about this. I don't know if you know this, but they both recorded that separately as solo songs. And then because of the success of the song, they then went back to the studio and did a duet. I don't know if you know that. It was first released by Neil Diamond. He wrote it. And then it was on his album, and Barbara Streisand said, oh, I like that song, and she did it. And I think hers was actually getting you know, more, more plays, and then they came together and did a duet. But the song, You Don't Bring Me Flowers Anymore, and this is what happens oftentimes in a relationship. We no longer bring flowers. We no longer uh, celebrate that person that we're, we're entertaining, the person that we're romancing. And, and that happens with us with Jesus. We we, we, we stop bringing him flowers. We, we, stop, we stop praising him. In Psalm 59, 16, it reads, I will sing aloud your mercies in the morning. We should get up in the morning. We should be singing praises to, to God for his mercies. We just spoke last week about mercy. Lord, I'm just thankful I'm not dead for what I've done. Thank you, God, that I have another day. And, and remember, mercy is not getting what you deserve. Right, and, and so I, I'm, I'm just thankful for that. Or Psalm 119, verse 64 reads, seven times a day, he writes there, seven times a day I will praise you. Right, and so if we, if we continue to be in praise 
with, uh, with him, for him, then it's going to be hard for you to lose your love for him. Psalm 149, verse 5, and I love this, and it speaks about that, that uh, we'll, we'll praise them from our beds. It reads that, that, let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud in their beds. Even when you go to bed at night, just thank you, Lord, I got through the day. And, and when you're doing that, that's like bringing them flowers. That's like, it, it's praising him. It's, it's, you know, if, if, I, if I never tell my wife I love her or she's beautiful, then what's going to happen? She's going to think that I don't care for her anymore. And so the Lord, he longs to hear from you. He loves you. He wants, he wants, he wants to hear your, your adoration. So, so some of the lessons we have from Ephesus are, I have a slide here, um, endure good works and faithfulness, um, be intolerant of evil, and to stay in love with Jesus. And this is what we learn from Ephesus. And, and again, it's not just for us as a church, but for us as individuals. And then moving on to the next church, uh, Smyrna, it's the second church listed. And it's one of two churches of the seven that does not receive criticism from the Lord, does not re- or I'm sorry, I gotta be more politically correct, uh, constructive feedback, right? Doesn't, Smyrna doesn't receive any constructive feedback. Is that, is that better? Is that not more like what they say in the workplace? Because um, I remember before when I was in early days of management, it was discipl- disciplinary action we had to take with employees. And then it became corrective action. Then it became coaching. You know, it was like, we don't want to offend anybody. You're not doing your job, you know? <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> but anyways, but, but here in, in the second, the second uh, church, he has, he has no constructive feedback for them. Um, and in fact, uh, only them in Philadelphia don't receive any, any constructive feedback. Um, he, he, Jesus praises uh, Smyrna for, for their good works. And, and he says this thing, he says, despite their tribulations and poverty, but in their poverty, they are rich. And that really st- jumped out at me, that, that in their poverty, they are rich. See, he, he writes in verse 10, be faithful unto death. Be faithful, be faithful unto death, which means that just going to church on Sundays isn't enough. That's what I got from that. That you can't just say, well, I go to church on Sundays, I'm good. He says, no, be faithful unto death. That means every day of the week, you should be faithful until your death or his return. And we should always be walking in faithfulness. You know, and, and, and I'm, I'm drawn back again to the, the whole aspect of, of Smyrna being rich in their poverty. Um, and because also, because he says this in, in James 2, 5, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in their faith? God's chosen the poor to be rich in their faith. Mark 8, 36 speaks about what does the profit of man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? So it tells us that our soul, our salvation, is greater than all the riches of the world. So each and every one of you are the richest person in the world if you have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you think about that, I mean, according to what Jesus says. Because again, what good is, and I I don't know where Elon Musk or or Bezos are with the Lord and their relationship. I, I I got an idea, but I don't know for certain. All right? But... What good is their money going to do when the day of judgment comes? It has, their money has nothing to do with it. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 32, it reads that, that he who acknowledges me before men, Jesus says, I will acknowledge before the Father. And then he who denies me before men, I will deny before the Father. It has nothing to do with your income. It has everything to do with your belief in Jesus Christ and who he is. And, and this is the thing that here I'm seeing about, about Smyrna. It wasn't about their riches. He says, even though if you're in poverty, he says, you're rich. Luke 12, 15 reads that life does not consist in an abundance of things that he possesses, meaning what you possess, what I possess. That, 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 is, not, that, is, that is not what our abundance consists of, is what we have. But it's, it's who we have. Amen? Not what we have but who we have in Jesus Christ, right? So Smyrna had little, but they had God's approval. They didn't have the applause of men, but they had God's approval. They had God's inheritance. And of course, Matthew 5, 5, you know this, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit 
the kingdom of God, right? And so not, not those that are, that are walking around and, and, and much and want, right? My greatest desire, and I've, I've said this for years when, to people, but my greatest desire is that to hear the Lord's words in Matthew 25, verse 21, say it to me and say it to my children, well done, good and faithful servant. And, and that's my desire that, that to hear that. And so when I read in, in verse 10 of chapter two to Smyrna, right, be faithful until death. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. So please do not think because you're here today and tomorrow with the devil, do not think that assures you the crown of life. He says, be faithful unto death. I know I'm stepping on some toes here, but I'm just, I'm just reading the word of God. He didn't say, come to church today and do whatever you want tomorrow. He says, be faithful unto death. So be faithful unto this. Serve the Lord all your days. Do not think because I got baptized when I was seven years old that I'm good to live like the devil the rest of my days. But you need to every day in Luke 9, 23 to take up your cross and follow him. That's what he says. He says daily take up your cross. He didn't say Sundays. He didn't say on the Lord's day. He didn't say on the Sabbath. But it is written every day. Daily take up your cross. Amen. So the lessons from Smyrna is good works and faithfulness are rewarded because he recognized that he saw that and, he, and that God's love is the greatest treasure of all. Those are the, the lessons from Smyrna. From Pergamos, the third, the third church, and this will be the last church we're gonna cover here today for you watch watchers. Um, he, in verse 13, he, he compliments them and tells them, you held fast, you hold fast, he says it's interesting, it's written interestingly, you, you hold fast to my name. Because they, they were not ashamed, they did not deny his name in, in chapter two, verse 13. They did not deny the name of Christ. So, so this is the good thing they're doing, is hold fast. Hold fast is another term uh, for, like, for being faithful, for, for holding, you know, holding on strongly. Um, Paul uses the same terminology in Hebrews 4, 14, where he says, let us hold fast our confession. That means what we speak, we speak the name of Jesus, we should hold fast, we should do that firmly and strongly. We, we should not deny who Christ is. Romans 1.16, right, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We should not be ashamed, we should hold fast to his name. But, but however, unfortunately, Pergamos compromised. They allowed false teachings in. They were following the teachings of Balaam and uh, the Nicolaitans. Uh, these were these real pagan pagan and uh, heathen, heathenistic uh, uh, religious practices. Um, and so he says, but you allowed this into your church. You allowed this amongst your people. You allowed this to be taught to the people. And, and this is the thing that we need to be careful. This is why you've heard me say it. You know, we just don't let anybody come up here and, and, and preach. We, want, we, we need to test their doctrine to make sure that they're sound. You know, for example, someone can come up and make a case and come up here and say, hey, polygamy is biblical. Right, so uh, I, I, think, I think your whole congregation needs to hear about polygamy. That, that this is, because it was done. I mean, Abraham had multiple wives, and Isaac had multiple wives, and Jacob had multiple wives, and, and they'll go on down the line to, you know, David had, you know, Solomon, oh, heaven forbid. You know, and, and they go down the line, but all these biblical examples of multiple wives. And then I can always point back to, well, remember the Lord says all things are lawful, but not all things are beneficial. And where did any of these people have peace and harmony with multiple wives. None of them. It didn't work because it wasn't God's plan. Remember, the whole, the whole Hagar and Ishmael thing, that wasn't God's plan. That was Sarah's idea. All right? It wasn't, it wasn't God telling them to do that. And, and so this is what I always tell people when people will point to issues like that in, in Scripture, say, well, what about this? He had, he had, you know, 300 wives and 700 concubines or vice versa. I always get it confused. It ends up being 1,000. It's just crazy. All right, but I, I just, I don't, I don't understand why people want to go and make that argument. And it's like, where was it beneficial? And, and the, in the life of Jacob, what happened? All the brothers despised Joseph. Why? Because Joseph was his favorite, because Joseph was the one from the woman he loved. Jacob didn't love Leah, unfortunately. He didn't love Leah. And Leah must have been extremely faithful. She, she bore him 10 sons. And then finally, Rachel 
um, delivers a, a son for him. And so he gives all, he showers all this attention to Joseph and all the other brothers become bitter. And you know what happened? Out of their bitterness and their jealousy and envy, they end up faking his death, telling their father he was dead, sell him off into slavery. And you want to tell me polygamy works? Uh, thank you. I got to keep my family together. Thank you very much. All right. And, and so, so if someone were to come in here and, and try to teach, say, say something like that, we'd say, no, we're not going to do, we're not going to allow that. And, and this is unfortunate. What, and I'm not saying that, that that was the issue being taught by Pergamus. I was just giving, you, giving that as an example about false doctrine, false teachings. And they had allowed that into them, into their congregation, into their midst. And so, so this is the thing that the Lord is displeased with. So the, the lessons from, uh, from, from Pergamus and if the musicians can make their way up, he, he tells them to, to hold on to his name, right? To, to hold firmly, to hold fast, to not let go. And he tells them do not compromise, basically. The lesson there is do not compromise. Do not, do not water things down. Um, I, I, you'll, you, you've heard me say that there is hell. There is, a, there is a lake of fire destined for you if your name is not written in the Lamb's book of life. That is a real place. And yet there are churches today who will say, well, don't preach about fire. Don't, teach, don't, don't preach about hell. That's going to turn people off. Well, then sh- but, but shame on me because then why would somebody then want to, if, if, they don't, if they don't understand the value of Jesus Christ, wouldn't you want to at least say, well, you know what? I don't want to go there. So let me hear about this other option. Right, but, if, but if, if, I, if I omit that from them, if I omit the truth, if I omit uh, the, the consequence for their actions, then I'm not doing my job. And, and then they don't have the full story. And, I, and I, like, I like to make an educated, I like to make an educated decision. Well, give me the information. What if I, okay, if I accept Jesus Christ, no matter what I've done, he forgives me and he loves me. If I don't do this, I go here and I burn for eternity. Hmm. Wow. No. I mean, it, to me, it's pretty simple. So if I never preach hell, if I never tell you about, uh, about the, you know, the, the consequences of our actions, you know, then, then there, there, there's less of a motivation for you to be drawn towards Jesus. Now, I would think that his love would be enough. But sometimes people haven't had a chance to experience his love. And we, and we want you to do that. And, and, but I want you to, and there's another lesson here with these churches. Because... He gives this message to Ephesus. He says, I will take my lampstand from you if you do not, if you do not return to your first love. He tells a Pergamus in, in chapter 2, verse 16, just like he tells Ephesus in 2, 5, this word is in both churches who were doing wrong. They had some opportunities for improvement. He says, Repent. And so here's a message here, a lesson here for us all. And I, I gave you these other items from each church. But the message here to them all, and we're going we're gonna to pick up some more next week when we cover the other churches. Because there's, there's, there's some other issues in the churches that could be affecting a church. And we want, we want, to, we want to take care of all these issues. I want to see, I, want, I really want us to see us in all seven of these churches. I do not want to sit here and ever be blinded and thinking that, Oh, we're good. We've arrived. We've got everything all together. As I shared earlier from Romans, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so I want all these things to be exposed. And so we take care of them so that we can be effective for the kingdom. But the, the word he says is repent. So that everyone stand to their feet. If there's anybody here today who needs to repent. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you need to reject Satan, you need to reject sin. You need to reject complacency in your life. I want you to come. I want you to come to the altar and pray. And, 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 and for those of you that are thinking we're about done here, we're not done yet. Because after we do this, I want to make sure we took care of this. I want to make sure there's anybody here who's never given their life to Jesus Christ. You have never confessed your sin. You've never said, Jesus, be Lord of my life. I will follow you all of my days. I want to live for you, Lord. If you've, never, if you've never said that prayer, if you've never asked him to forgive you, we want you to do that today. First and foremost is here's why. Because after we do this, I'm going to ask you all to sit down. We're going to take communion together. Because 
God's grace is so wonderful. As he's rebuking Ephesus, as he's rebuking Pergamos and the other churches you're going to see, he tells them all, repent. He wasn't done with them. He wasn't saying this is over. We love and we're going to get to Laodicea next week. We always hear about Laodicea. I spit you out of my mouth because you're lukewarm. I spit, I spew you out. But he wants them all to repent. He wants you to repent. And this is why I said, this is the, the victory I see in Revelation. That he's not given up. He says repent. So I encourage you, if there's anybody here today who's never accepted Christ, to please, please come. Hallelujah. Thank you. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. We're going we're gonna to pass the communion elements. And in this message of repentance, remember the Lord, he gives us instructions in Corinthians to examine ourselves before taking the communion. To, I hope you took this time when I spoke about repentance to examine yourselves and repent of anything that's in your life that keeps popping up, that, keep, that you keep going back to Proverbs 26, you're, 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 you're the fool repeating his folly. You keep returning back to it. Repent of it today. You don't, you don't need to have to come up here and do that. You can right there where you are. Repent. Ask the Lord to forgive you and turn away from it. Because we're going to receive this communion because part of receiving this communion is, is being right with the Lord. We want you to be right with the Lord. So, is there one? Oh, thank you. So if you would, please, if you can tear away that top thin film. Huh. I went all the way down to the juice part. Can I get another one? Thank you, Godfrey. Yes, sir. Aha, got it. Jesus on that last supper, it read that he, he broke the bread. So if you would please break it. He broke the bread and he said, this is my body broken for you. That means he, he was giving his body for us. So understand that this is not just some tasteless wafer. But this is, this is just a reminder. So there's a serve as a reminder of, of what Jesus did for us. That he gave his all for us. So he said, he, he took this, he said, do this in remembrance of me. So take this in remembrance of what Christ did for you. Praise the Lord. And then he took the, um, the wine that night and he passed it around to his disciples. And again, I, I always like to say it this way is, the bread reminds me of who he is, the bread of life. And the wine represents what he did, the shedding of his blood. Because there's life in the blood. He gave his life. He shed his blood for us for the forgiveness of our sins. And so like Ephesus, who had forsaken their first love, I don't want you to be like that. Do not forget what he has done, but remember what he has done. Again, in the words of Jesus, do this in remembrance of me. Take the juice. Father, we love you and thank you, God, for your goodness. Thank you, my Lord, for blessing us with this gathering this time. My God, thank you for the faithfulness of the saints that are here. Father, we help us to take these lessons from the church and apply it in our lives. Let us not forsake our first love. Let us continue doing good works for you, my Lord. Let us not allow unfaithfulness and ungodly teaching in our lives. But Father, let us always turn to your word for truth and discernment, my God. I ask Lord, you bless everybody here today. In Jesus' name, amen. If anyone please rise to your feet. One last altar call as we rise to our feet and the ushers will come by and pick up your cups from you. Now, the altar is open for any other need. And again, if you feel, still feel you were unsure about coming up here to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. 
come now. Come now, do not wait. This, this could be the day of your salvation. This could be your eternity right here. So don't, don't pass this up and come. And if anybody else has another need, if you have a financial need, a, a relation, relationship need, a marital need, a, a job need, a, Father, you're, 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 you, you've got sickness in your body, come. Come and find one of these altar workers. They will pray with you. They will be in agreement. There's people coming now. Do not be afraid. Remember Matthew chapter 10. It says, if you deny me, then I'll deny you, he says. Don't deny what, what God is doing in your life. But come and, and receive prayer. Amen? Go ahead. Praise the Lord. I can see one thing to I can see you.